Good, good, good evening, class. I'm here to talk to you about markets and the history of economics. My name is um, um, my name is uh, Edward Stringer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I view I view economics as the study of human action, the study of how humans make choices. We can think about this in all areas of life, including uh, there are economists who study how people make choices in bureaucracies or through the political sphere. Uh, but one very important area of economics is perhaps the most important area of economics is how people make choices in markets. Okay, the study of human action in markets. I think that is uh, basically most of what economics is. And there's different approaches to how we want to study how humans make choices in markets. And there's different schools of thoughts within economics. So what I'm going to do is basically provide you with a very, very brief overview, it's not scientific in any way, of some of the famous economists that I think are important, and then to just highlight how different people have slightly different approaches to studying the world. I'm going to highlight what in modern times people call Austrian economics, but really make the case that this is part of a much larger tradition, and even that term, I think, is a little bit narrow. Uh, but I'm okay with that term if we want to use that term, but I think that the term is uh, much bigger. There's also a tendency, I think, sometimes for people to say, who is the first person, and then who's the next person, and then who's the next person, as if we're studying, like, the Pope. Who's the, who is the first pope, who's the second pope, who's the third pope? And I think we want to try and avoid that style of thinking. So who's the first economist? Adam Smith. Okay, I think that's a good answer. I consider Adam Smith the first famous economist. Uh, but even with him, there are other people writing before him. And, so it's okay that we refer to him as the first economist, but there were other people uh, before him. Some of the uh, people that I think were very important were people named Richard Cantillon, Turgot. These people were writing a little bit before him. Bernard Mandeville. They didn't quite write a treatise in the same way that Adam Smith did, and Adam Smith kind of put it all together in this large book called The Wealth of Nations. And so perhaps he's more rightly uh, famous, but we can go back in time. There's a great book by Henry Clark, which is called Commerce, Culture, and Li uh, Liberty, Essays on Capitalism Before Adam Smith. And you can find plenty of people writing in Holland, 100 years before Adam Smith, talking about a lot of the principles, uh, a lot of the principles that come out in Adam Smith. One thing that Adam Smith is very famous for is the invisible hand analogy. The invisible hand analogy, just a show of hands, who here has heard the invisible hand analogy? Okay, everybody, almost, not everybody. All right, basically, it's not out of regards for other people that the butcher, the brewer, and the baker cook your meal but it's out of their regard to self-interest, but market forces, markets, markets, <laughs> markets, are encouraging the, the brewer, the, the, the butcher, the baker to, to uh, provide food for us. Why? Do they like us? In part because they like our money. Okay? So they're not being directed by the government to provide food for us, but they're being directed by us 
They're being directed by our wallet, by our pocketbook. Mises was a famous Austrian economist, I'll talk about him in a few minutes. But he said, markets are simply the outcome of buying and the abstention from buying. Buying and the abstention from buying. How do we know what goods are going to show up in the store? What kind of bread? What kind of beer? It's us. It's buying and the abstention from buying. When we go to the store and buy more bread, the next seller goes, oh, okay, great, I need to sell more bread. We don't go to the store, we abstain from buying. There's too much bread on the shelves. They say, okay, we're going to cut back. And we can think about this as the invisible hand. The invisible hand directs markets to provide everything. Should we have more uh, Hewlett Packard computers? Should we have more Apple computers? The invisible hand is determining that. Markets are determining that. You, the customer, said, hello, hello, HP. Have this computer, and HP said, sure thing. Here you go. So buying the extension from mine determines all of these market outcomes. Uh, other important economists I'm going to mention briefly and then get into what is now known as the Austrian School of Economics <coughs> included. Uh, after Adam Smith, he influenced a lot of other people. Richard Cobden was a uh, fan of Adam Smith. And he highlighted Adam Smith's lessons about free trade and also the importance of specialization. And he advocated getting rid of what were known as the Corn Laws in England. That was basically restrictions on grains coming in and out. And Adam Smith said, you know what, this theory I have is interesting, but it's impossible, it never happened. And within a few decades, Richard Cobden and some other people basically got a large amount of free trade implemented in England not that long after Adam Smith was living. So I think he was very important. Other important people include, uh, I'll mention David Ricardo. He's kind of known for specialization, the law of comparative advantage. If people specialize in one thing and other people specialize in another thing, you can trade and both can have more compared to if everybody did everything. Even the person who's not as good at something, if they specialize in something that they're less bad at, and the person who specializes in what they're even better at, both parties can produce more total trade, and everybody has more. Um, in France, there were a couple other economists, Jean-Baptiste Say, Frederick Bastiat, Frederick Bastiat talked about how people can exchange, benefit from each other, help each other out. He has a book called Economic Harmonies, and he says when you interact with people in market, you're actually bringing people together. You're coordinating people's choices. So you don't need to go home and try and build a computer from scratch. Instead, You've got these people in Silicon Valley working on your behalf to create that computer. I don't need to grow sheep at my house and shear them and then figure out how to like weave a suit. Instead, I simply come here and then instantly the suit appears. <laughs> When people can exchange services of what they're good at, you can get other people working on your behalf to produce things for you. The soup maker does this in exchange for my services. 
and I don't directly work for Brooks Brothers or any other suit company, but I work for other people and they give me these certificates In my country, we call them dollars. <laughs> and then I simply give these certificates to the suit company and say, here, I have a bunch of certificates that I got that show that I've done this work. All right, so these are some uh, uh, important economists, in my opinion. I'm leaving out probably uh, many, many good ones. <clears throat> But by the end of the uh, 19th century, there eventually emerged what was called the Austrian School of Economic Thought. And I personally think that there's economic truths in the world, but we don't always know them. And at any given time, people can be blind to certain truths that they just haven't really thought out too well. So Adam Smith, I think was great for talking about the importance of trade and how people can have more if they interact with each other, if they specialize. But Adam Smith, on certain topics, I would say, was a little bit confused. And he wasn't as clear as modern economists, specifically, how do goods have value? And I'm gonna slightly mischaracterize his views and make him sound perhaps worse than he was. But he kind of believed in a labor theory of value, which just said a good is valued based on how many hours it takes to make. And the problem with this theory is different people have different productivities. And so one unit of uh, your labor is not the same as one unit of your sister or brother's labor or your cousin's labor. Each person has different amounts of productivity. And even if you have the same amount of productivity, you could spend your time on producing a good that people don't want. And spending an hour on a good that people don't want is not as valuable as producing something that people really want. So the labor theory of value has been discredited by modern Economists, but there was this big puzzle for many years and they would have these kind of complicated theories There was something called the diamond water paradox. Why are uh, uh, Diamonds worth more than water Well, They had these very complicated theories about use value exchange value and It was really in the 1870s when economists clearly explained why goods have value. And there's precursors to this, so I'm kind of exaggerating here. Missing out on certain people. Uh, Condillac had a uh, theory of like this a long time before. But in the 1870s, there were basically three major economists, Menger, Jevons, and Walras. Maybe Bernoulli, if you want to. <laughs> I was looking him up about the, the uh, theory of value, and I didn't s confirm your hypothesis, but I, I'm open to, uh, to your idea that, that other people said this before. Uh, but basically, they derived what we would now refer to as a modern demand curve. Prices, at high prices, people demand less. At low prices, people demand more. And they derived these demand curves in fairly different ways, but part of it is, depending on how many units of the good are out there, the value of the good differs. And I'm going to highlight Menger's contribution, because he did it in a slightly different way from the other guys who did it in a more, I'll just say a mathematical way. Menger viewed, so Menger's considered the first Austrian economist, Menger viewed choices from a logical perspective, a common sense perspective. And he said, let's analyze individuals consuming different goods and then valuing them based on their current situation. And he said, 
You can have four identical goods, but based on how many you have, the value is going to be different. And so we can think about this in the extreme case uh, with water. If you are starving, or you're, you're uh, going to die of thirst rather, water is extremely valuable to you. This first unit of water saves your life. The next one, okay, now I'm not dying right now, that's good, now I'm feeling good. The next unit of water is identical to the first one, but its value to you is very different. And then the tenth unit of water, the thousandth unit of water, it's very different. So right now, I hope most people showered this month. Good lesson. I shower every month, whether I need it or not. <laughs> and I don't value the water as if I'm in the desert. I value the water as if I just have 10,000 gallon of water. There's plenty of water coming out of the faucet. And so I'm like, okay, cool, great. I'll stay in the, in the shower a little bit longer. Because I've got so much of it, it's very different. I'll give you another quick example uh, that economists talk about. Uh, Robinson Crusoe on an island has one bag of grain. The first one will be to survive. The next, next bag of grain will be to plant. And the next bag of grain could be for his pet parrot. Each bag of grain is identical. But allocating it to its most important use is different from allocating it to its least important use in case of feeding the parrot. So what Carl Menger did is he derived what we now refer to as the law of decreasing marginal utility. The value of good depends on how many you have. And it's not based on how long you take to make it, but it's how much you like it. That's it. How much do you like it? And this is now referred to the subjective theory of value. Value, economic value is subjective. We can't go around and measure, put like a microscope and say, okay, how much do you value this pen? How much do you value that pencil? How much do you value that marker? It's only in your own mind, based on what objectives you're trying to fulfill and how you're feeling. So a lot of non-economists have this idea, oh, you know, we need more of this, we need more of this, we need more of this. And if you take the Menger view that value is subjective, people simply have to think whether they like something or not. What's better, chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? Well, I think that vanilla ice cream is objectively better. Look at how great it looks. You can see the vanilla beans. No, I think that chocolate ice cream is objectively better. Look at how beautiful it looks. You can see the, co the, the, the cocoa beans. No, strawberry ice cream is objectively better. You can see the strawberries. Okay? For me to emphasize this is to show it's an economic fallacy for people to be thinking that way. Value is determined by how people like it. That's it. And we might change our preferences. In the future, we might not like strawberry ice cream. There was a thing when I was a kid, it was just ridiculous, it was a joke, but funny, where you could buy a pet rock, and you would open it up, and there was a rock, and there was a leash, and everyone was like, ah. <laughs> it's silly, but you know, it illustrates the point. If somebody finds it funny, then it has value. Once the joke wore off, people didn't like it. We can look at this with all goods, music, art, everything depends on how people are thinking. 
at a particular time. So that was one of main, main, Menger's main contributions. And one of the other things that he was famous for was markets as emergent orders. There are people who basically say government needs to create things and design things. And his view was, no, things can just happen in many cases in ways that we don't understand. And we can think about the following example as an extension of Adam Smith's invisible hand theory. One thing that Menger was famous for is, why do we have money? And he basically said, well, you could barter, you can trade things on your own without using money, but it's easier, it's, it's better if you can find a common unit which has certain characteristics, specifically those associated with gold. If you can store it, you can split it up. It's easy to evaluate. And he said that money had to evolve through what we would now call an emergent order or a spontaneous order. And nobody needed to actually point to gold and say, this is the best good for trading. It's just like, hey, this is really convenient. This is really convenient. Because if you have something like money, like gold, you don't have to run into somebody who happens to have what you want. I am actually the only economist I know who, who's bartered. Burger. Bartered my goods for somebody else. Which means I had to meet somebody else who had goods that I needed, I wanted, and um, they also wanted an economics lesson in this particular case. I was just sitting around all day bored and this other person there was an uh, opera singer. And I was like, can you teach me about singing? And I was like, I'll give you a free economics lesson. <laughs> so I did barter, but in most cases it's better <coughs> to use money because you don't have to find the specific person who wants what you want at any given time. And this is not determined by the government, it's determined by Markets, 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 markets. The invisible hand, the invisible hand <laughs> determines what is sold, what people are doing at any given time, and how prices are determined. Menger really is the first one to think about demand curves and supply curves, and how as things change, the quantity of the good changes, the price will change. One of his students was named Eugene, I'm pronouncing the American way, Eugene Bombavirk. Eugene Eugene Bombavirk. And he really kind of ran with this and helped elaborate what we now think about in terms of supply and demand. He also talked about other prices as well. An important price is the interest rate. Interest rate is simply a price of when you have money now or you loan it out for a year. You'll do that if you're compensated for giving it up for a year. There's an opportunity cost of that. And uh, what's the optimal interest rate? Just depends on the person. Somebody doesn't care about having that money right now, then they'll give that money. And Buying and the extension from buying, including in the loan market, determines interest rates. There's inflation, we can talk about that later. But without inflation, buying and the extension for buying determines interest rates. That's it. All prices are determined by buying and the extension from buying. I really love think pads. Give me more of those think pads. I really love. Uh, Sparkling water, give me more of those sparkling waters. Bidding up the prices of those goods.